Hello, this is Sean Mullery from Electronic Engineering at IT Sligo, and in this short video, I'm going to be talking to you about development tools. Now, these are the pieces of software and the pieces of hardware that you would use to develop uh, applications for an embedded system. Now, again, the development tools are you know, the one of the pieces of software that you would regularly use um, is the integrated development environment, and this is one of those terms that's sometimes just referred to again as the compiler. Whereas in actual fact, it's far more than a, just simply a compiler because it includes a lot of things. We'll be mentioning those in a minute. So the first thing we're going to look at is the integrated development environment. The second thing we're going to look at is software debuggers. And the third thing we're going to look at is hardware debuggers and the differences between those. So uh, moving on to the integrated development environment, this is the piece of software that you use, that you install on your machine, uh, this is on the development machine to develop the application for your piece of hardware. Now, there are lots of development environments for uh, embedded systems. So the one that we're going to look at is the MPLAB X integrated development environment. So it uses the term integrated because we've integrated a lot of different tools together all into one development environment. Typically, it would include a text editor. Now, that seems very obvious that you would have to you would be able to write text. But strictly speaking, you could write your C files in a, an ordinary in Notepad or any of those text editors and save them as a .c and use them in your system. Um, and if you had separate compilers and linkers that you did it all on command line uh, operations, that's how you would do it. However, if you have an integrated development environment, it's all the better because it'll generally have a text editor. And even better than just having a text editor is if it has a text editor that has syntax highlighting. So this is where your code um, uh, has different colors associated with it and different fonts associated with it, depending on whether it's a keyword or whether it's an open brace or a closing brace or whether it's a comment and so on, so that it's very easy to actually read your code. So just to um, pop into um, MPLAB X here, we can see the syntax highlighting here we can see that the hash include here is in green, whereas the actual name of the file is in uh, an orange color. And if we go down here further, we can see any comments that we write are in a light gray so that they're, they're, they're not as obvious as the rest of the code. Um, standard sort of uh, black font for um, for uh, most of the functions and so on and the keyword and, and, the, and the words that we use. But the <coughs> uh, we notice here that some of the special keywords such as void, uh, and while, okay, and unsigned there and char, they're written in a blue text uh, to tell them apart. So syntax highlighting is a very useful uh, feature to have in any uh, development tools that you would be dealing with. The development tool or the development environment will generally have your compiler, your linker, and your locator all involved in there as well. So <clears throat> normally you can compi compile individual files if you don't want to compile the entire program. If you if you want to build the entire program, which means compiling all the files, linking them all together, creating a lo um, the final lo uh, locatable um, file or hex file that will go down in the machine, you can also do that. Um, sometimes it's handier to be just compiling one individual file because if you're working on a very large project with lots of programmers, um, the compile process can take several hours uh, if it's a very, very large program. So it wouldn't be a good idea for every time you made a change to completely recompile everything. Uh, and there's no necessity for doing that. But generally speaking, for the sort of programs that you will be writing in this, in this uh, subject, you'll probably get away with just rebuilding it each time. Sometimes your development environment will have a loader as well. So this is a, um, a system to actually get it from the, the hex file situation down onto the chip. Now, sometimes that comes separately. So depending on the, the environment you're using or depending on the piece of hardware, the target that you're using, uh, it may or may not have a loader. Now, the MPLAB um, is able to download to a chip as long as you have the correct piece of hardware to go with it. Um, but if you're using uh, another piece of hardware, for example, one of the pieces of hardware we will be using um, here will be a, a, a from a company called Matrix Multimedia. And that piece of hardware, uh, because it comes from a different company, it, it's not an exact uh, crossover to just download it. <clears throat> so you have to use a loader from the other company in order to get your, your file down. So it may not be part of, it may not be integrated into your development environment. The other thing you would expect or hope that integra the integrated development environment would have is a simulator, 
uh, or some sort of debugger and uh, ideally um, some way of, of doing emulation as well. And this is uh, where we, we'll be explaining these on the next two slides because they're the softer debuggers and the harder debuggers. So the software debuggers, first of all, these, these generally take the form of a simulator um, or it, it may be just that you, you, you just go down through your code step by step and you can look at certain variables. Um, now, the simulator is meant to act like the hardware, but in software. So if you didn't have the piece of hardware there with you or, as I mentioned here at the end of this slide, if the hardware does not actually exist yet, um, if you have a simulator that pretends to be the hardware, you can check if your code works uh, and make sure that it's working probably 90-95% before you put it down on the hardware. The reason I say 90-95% to is that the, um, the simulator uh, is not the real piece of hardware and therefore there will always be slight differences or things that it hasn't taken into account. Um, so you need to be aware of that, but the simulator is very, very useful for getting you to that point. So it simulates the target hardware in software on the develop machine. It typically allows you to run the program, so free run it, in other words, run it as fast as it can go, or you can step through it line by line, so you can hit a key every time you want to move from one line to the next and watch and see what happens to all the different variables and all the different ports and so on as it does it. You can also set breakpoints, so you can say, okay, I want you to run and run until you get to this point here, and then I want you to stop. So there's a particular part of your program that you're interested in, you want it to stop at that point and it'll run and then stop at that point and then you can look at the status of all the different registers and the ports and so on at that point. You can also watch individual variables and see how they change. So if you've made a variable in your code, you can see how that changes over time. You can uh, have a look at the port, the port pins off the chip uh, to see if they're ones and zeros or what are they. And you can also use a logic analyzer, which is, is effectively like looking at an oscilloscope output of the ports, but you can, you can look at several of them all at the one time, which means that you can see uh, how they interact with, with each other. Again, you'll be seeing lots of examples of this throughout the course. Important to realize it's not the real hardware, so there will always be slight differences from the real thing. Not least the fact that the generally the software cannot run as fast as hardware. So if something was physically run down in an embedded system, it would run faster than what the simulator would run. And therefore, uh, it doesn't necessarily run at exactly the speed. It's also not always possible to um, interact with the simulator in the same way as a, a user would interact with the final hardware embedded system. So that can be difficult to simulate. Has some major advantages though. It's very simple and quick to use. So it means you don't have to be constantly downloading to the system and trying to debug on the piece of hardware itself. Uh, it's generally much cheaper than hardware debuggers because it comes, it'll often come directly with the integrated development environment for free. Um, it's very useful if the hardware does not exist, as I mentioned. Now you might think, well, why would, what would be the point of writing a program for a piece of hardware that didn't exist? But actually, because of the pace of the technology uh, goes these days, uh, oftentimes a new project is started to develop software for a piece of hardware that has yet to be released. So you know a certain amount of information, you have a simulator of that piece of hardware, but the p physical piece of hardware does not actually exist. You haven't been able to purchase it yet or you haven't been able to get your hands on it because it's still being developed. So this is where simulators are very good because what the what the hardware people can do is they can tell you what the, what the thing should do. You can develop a simulator for that. You can then write your code to see if it will work properly. Meanwhile, the people are actually developing the real hardware and they can update the simulator as they go. So it's very useful for, for those sort of things where you have to write your code for a piece of hardware that doesn't yet exist um, and you have to work around those problems um, because if you waited for the hardware to exist, you would already be behind the curve. You'd be too, too slow uh, in developing your product. Now, there are also hardware debuggers or sometimes called remote debuggers and there are lots of different versions of these. I'm really only going, to, only going to mention one type here, which is the ICE or the in-circuit emulator. This is where you have your microchip and your circuit and what you do is you take out the microchip out of the circuit that you're using. So the circuit might have um, sensors on it and actuators for motors and so on, but you take the microchip out of that and you, you replace it with an in-circuit emulator, which is something that pretends to be the microchip, but can talk back and forth to the development PC that you're working on. So you place this into the circuit and place the microchip. It's still connected to the develop machine, development machine, and it acts just like uh, the microprocessor um, with the rest of the hardware. 
you can control and watch the operation of the chip from the developed machine while it's operating on the hardware. So it means you can actually physically stop the chip at different points or step through it and it'll operate on the hardware in that way. Okay, and you can see what's happening on the microcontroller while it's operating in the physical hardware. The problem with these things is that they're generally very expensive because to actually get something to pretend to be the microchip to sit in there or your microcontroller, to, um, that, that can be very expensive to create, uh, often th thousands of euros. Um, so it's not always uh, the best system to have if you want to be developing something for a quite reasonable price. However, some microcontroller systems include this as part of the chip so you no longer have to replace the chip the chip will act or has a certain amount of debugging hardware inside it so that if you if you switch this debugging on it can then communicate back with a development uh, machine and tell it what's going on and uh, some of the, the the PIC systems have this so some systems such as the PIC allow for a cheaper solution by having debug system natively on the chips OK, these can then be controlled and debugged from the develop machine using standard um, using the standard microchip that's in your thing. So you don't have to replace it with an in circuit emulator. It acts like it as long as you have set up your circuit that it can do this debugging. OK, now that having that debugging on on the system means that you have to have a little bit of extra memory for for all that information to be in place. So it has its disadvantages, but it is a much cheaper way to develop a system and to, to be able to debug it in hardware. There's no replacement for actually being able to debug in hardware. It's very, very useful to have, but it's obviously <coughs> slower and more expensive um, and <coughs> sometimes just not actually possible because the hardware doesn't exist. So in those situations where you can't use a harder debugger, the softer debugger can be very, very useful. OK, um, so just to remind you uh, that the that your development tools generally include an integrated development environment where you can actually develop your code, um, compile it, link it, load it uh, and uh, simulate it. Um, but generally, they also your development tools would include a software debugger, some way of actually debugging, getting rid of bugs in your code and testing it uh, in software. And hopefully your development tools would also include a hardware debugger um, where you're actually able to do the final amount of debugging or getting rid of all the, the final little issues on the physical hardware itself. That is the closest step to actually just having a final system that runs on its own. Okay.